Today, I'm speaking to a man who is one of the most inspirational people on my Facebook feed. And every time he posts something, I pause and I read it very carefully. And then I contemplate a little bit about it. And then I continue. But before we get into the conversation, please uh, tell us who are you? Hi, Jason. Uh, thanks for having me on tonight. Uh, it's uh, nice to be in discussion with you. Uh, my name is Daniel Pohl, um, Canadian uh, father, husband, uh, engineer, many different aspects uh, could address that question, but uh, I'll leave it at that. Awesome. That's like without any hesitation there, just, you know, a bunch of aspects and facets. So, what is it to you, and this is you know, one of the reasons why I have massive respect for you, apart from the fact that you're a soulful guy and all this kind of stuff, is that you're a genius. So let's start there. What does it mean to be a genius, both in sort of formal way as well as the way you look at it? Uh, the formal way uh, typically is uh, to define um, a distribution of uh, results uh, based on standardized testing. Uh, so you need a sufficient sample size. And based on those test results, uh, which may or may not be good tests, to be honest, uh, it, uh, you define a number of standard deviations above the mean uh, at which you would uh, consider someone a genius. And typically, with the more mainstream tests, that's three standard deviations above the mean. Or uh, more specifically, it's an IQ of 145, uh, where the standard deviation is 15. Uh, in terms of what I consider to be a genius, it sort of deviates from that. Um, I'm of the philosophy that anyone can be a genius. In fact, we're all geniuses at being ourselves, I like to, to frame it. Um, there's uh, almost an epidemic to use statistics to compare ourselves. Uh, we're not the same. Every person I've met is uh, uniquely individual. Uh, and it's, it's uh, almost a shame to limit them uh, by comparisons to others. Every person seems to be a, um, a universe unto themselves where you can explore uh, the various as uh, facets of their being. Um, and they, they are able to reach places no other individual can reach. Uh, and that, uh, in its essence, is the definition of a genius. Um, obviously, there are more pragmatic measures of, uh, of being a genius, and there are the multiple intelligence types. Uh, and you can go into that and, and define specific skill sets for where one individual can obviously exceed the abilities of another individual. But on the whole, uh, it's really unfair to uh, us as individuals to uh, do that cross comparison, in my opinion. So do you think that it's possible to get to the bottom of oneself, to the core essence of oneself? And if so, what happens then? I think as you, um, as you mature in life, there are definitely different directions in which you can take that question. In terms of reaching a bottom, no, I, I don't think there's uh, reaching a bottom, which is actually motivation for myself. I, I learn new things about myself every day. Um, I learn new things about the people I'm close with, including yourself. I, I love to watch your Facebook feed as well. Very inspiration, motivational things where I, I see it as a two-way relationship where um, I continue to explore myself, like I said, as a, as a limitless universe, um, as well as learn from each other. Uh, it's, it's great. Uh, it's uh, the teacher-student relationship. I'm, I'm a teacher, but I'm also a student of everyone I encounter. There's no person you can't learn something from uh, and use that information, that uh, lesson they provide you as a reflection on yourself. And uh, just like you would uh, change your hairstyle <laughs> and look in the mirror and, uh, you know, consider yourself slightly different. I consider those relationships life altering as well. Um, and so people change me. I change over time. 
I, I take in new lessons and I like to evolve. It's the joy of being alive. Where does intelligence come from? Yeah, it's a good question. And um, it's one that hasn't been answered, uh, uh, at least by no measure of consensus. There are various schools of thought that I've uh, encountered. Um, in terms of my personal uh, understanding, I really do go right to uh, the fundamental levels. I, as you may know, I'm a, a nuclear engineer and part of that was studying nuclear physics and uh, subatomic particles and forces. Uh, so I tend to break things down very abstractly, trying to get to uh, the essence of, of truths. So as far as I can tell, uh, intelligence is the ability to um, observe the environment and adapt uh, by uh, effectively recognizing what you need to do in order to make it to the next uh, moment in time. Uh, so that's a very evolutionary uh, way to frame intelligence, but I, I think it's more basic than that. Um, everything, as far as I can tell, has some sort of a memory. And if you think about it in terms of physical parameters, uh, you know, you might not think a rock, uh, much of a rock. <laughs> it's sort of one of these base things that are always around and uh, we just, uh, we throw rocks, we kick rocks, <laughs> you know, that we don't give them uh, a second thought. But when you actually think about what they are, they, they have a molecular structure. Uh, they're relatively uniform. Um, if you start to inquire and drill down into uh, what they actually are, um, they have a set of physical parameters, which one could consider as a, as a history or um, a memory even of what they've been through in the universe. They have a certain awareness, uh, as I like to put it. I know that uh, rubs some philosophers the wrong way when I say awareness, but I really do just mean uh, an information capacity. They store information in a specific form. And when you look at it, you can recognize their significance there. Uh, at some point uh, that uh, shifts to consciousness for myself. So I, I, I consider the larger set awareness um, and that just means existence for me really. Um, and then the, the smaller set is consciousness. Uh, and, uh, you know, you can think of many different uh, definitions for consciousness as well. Um, some of them uh, are just uh, a, an ability to think, um, uh, cognito ergo sum, um, but some are more strategic in nature. Uh, and intelligence is, is I consider it a, a subset of consciousness. So on the whole, you've got this large awareness, then consciousness, and then intelligence is a, a smaller subset of phenomena that occur within those larger spheres. That all reminds me of a talk by Alan Watts, which is entitled Higher Than a Potato, uh, where <laughs> he talks about how we're not really able to necessarily know whether a potato is more intelligent or less intelligent and uh, conscious than we are. Because when you start inquiring into potatoes' life, you might say, well, it's just a stupid potato. It's in the ground. It doesn't have eyes and so on. But then really, it's just calm there. It's not trying to buy yet another car or pay a bill or a mortgage. Uh, and it's pollinated by bees, you know, which are his friends and all that kind of stuff. So potato is doing something very smart. <laughs> uh, in fact, you know, many of us want to be more like the potato and be able to just be comfortable being grounded Tell me a little bit about then how do you conceptualize universe as an atomic universe? Uh, right now, what, what we're doing is I'm writing a book called Designed Company, but really what it is about is what I call fractal management. So it's like breaking down every task, every project into atomic units of tasks and then saying we, can, we should be having a system that enables us to manage any project under the sun, quite literally, through atomic units of tasks that, that build towards delivering that project. And the system seems to be working much better than we envisaged. So you as a nuclear physicist, nuclear engineer, how do you actually conceptualize of the universe? Do you see atoms as material units or are they just more of a kind of 
clusters of tetrahedrons as someone like Jim Carrey would talk about. And, you know, what, what is universe actually made out of? So there are all sorts of different ways to see this in terms of what's real. You know, I, I'm, I'm still a skeptic uh, in some sense. Uh, I, I'm open to ideas. I, I understand logic. I understand evidence. But I also understand personal experience, which is where science falls short uh, a lot of the time. So in, in terms of whether it's matter, whether it's information, um, whether it's something else, uh, I don't think I'll ever be able to close the door on that, to be honest. And so how do you see archetypes as we slowly venture into the Jungian psychology? How do you see archetypes and how do you conceptualize of archetypes in terms of are they fragments of the psyche or are they building components of the psyche or are they like fully fledged configurations of the mind or something like that? What, what's your take on this? I think, you know, there are different aspects uh, to archetypes. There's the image uh, that we recognize as an archetype. So if, you know, someone brought up the image of our mother, we'd instantly have warm feelings of the mother archetype. But if you were born to any other mother, you would uh, use that picture as your archetype. So there's the experience-based aspects where it fills in these, what I call information wells, uh, basically repositories for real world experience in, in our minds. Uh, and, and that's obviously a function of our brain structure. So uh, in terms of, uh, you know, understanding this from a mechanistic point of view, we have a certain brain, uh, you know, we've got a large prefrontal cortex. We've, you know, we've got the reptilian uh, aspects at the, the core. There are certain ar archetypes that are just built into the structure of our brains. Um, and I don't think we understand all of these, um, but we understand uh, many of these uh, different archetypes and how they um, are embedded in, in our thoughts. Um, and so, Specific archetypes uh, in a personal lifetime are really a, a function of the information we put into these information wells, but they're a function of the information wells being there to begin with. Uh, if you have nothing, if you don't have a basket uh, to store apples in, you're, you're not going to be able to hold the apples, right? Um, and so understanding this uh, mechanism uh, and what brain structures lead to specific archetypes um, and what, what archetypes are uh, impaired by specific brain damage would be a great study uh, in terms of understanding what these archetypes are, where they live in the brain, um, and allow us to make progress in terms of uh, understanding what would lead to potentially a, a fulfilling life. So what I'm hearing is that you're thinking of archetypes almost as a physical imprint on the on the human as opposed to like a conceptual template or even let's say psychological template that's right uh, i mean they have to be connected uh, people like to separate this into the duality of the mind and the body uh, but they're intricately uh, connected in, in a number of ways um, and it's not just the physical aspects but um, you know it, that's definitely part of it. And uh, what the way I like to think of archetypes is sort of like the equivalent of a um, phenotype in, in terms of DNA expression. So uh, effectively, uh, if you have an image that is associated uh, uh, or you resonate with, say you find a, a beautiful mate or you have a, a specific occupation that just really sits well with you or on the opposite side, you really hate, um, then there's something to that. Um, and that's a, a basically uh, the equivalent of a phenotype in terms of DNA. The genotype itself is, is essentially the uh, ideas that the information wells that, that sit there. Um, in terms of the DNA structure of what consciousness is, what intelligence is, I think that is effectively um, 
can be explored, but it's a yet unknown structure, just like we had the hunt for the DNA structure in the 60s and, and the 50s with Watson and Crick uh, and, uh, you know, Franklin with her X-ray crystallography. Um, I think the archetypes are a way to, uh, again, to draw an analogy is to um, get an image, almost like an X-ray crystallography that will allow you to also connect it to a, a phenotype. And I, I think the really big breakthrough in psychology and intelligence and spirituality and all these things will come with understanding that, uh, that structure that um, uses the brain as a, as a substrate to, uh, to replicate the ideas. I'm, I'm having to sort of soak that in a little bit as an answer. I'm going to have to re-listen to that on the on the recording and and really unpick unpick the statements that you made because it's it's profound. And I have a feeling also that you have a better direct connection with this understanding than most people that I speak to, because I also notice I've, I've been practicing this thing called statement analysis, uh, which is what FBI interrogation agents use to detect whether someone is lying or whether they've killed someone and so on. So I pay attention a lot to how people speak. And when people speak directly without hesitation, it means that they've thought this through quite well. And it's really connecting with their psyche, uh, as opposed to they're having to sort of make it up as they go along, and they're not quite sure. So they come up with a lot of ums and ahs and correct the words they say and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so that's where Although the you don't want to play it back then, because I'm sure if you play it back, you'll hear plenty of ums and ahs from me. So <laughs> and uh, so the question then comes, is what's the difference between brain and mind in your view? Brain is obviously the physical object. Um, it's the um, it's the material side of who we are. Uh, it's 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 not something that you can easily dismiss, right? Um, and whether it creates the mind or the mind. Uh, latches on to the structure of the brain is still an open question framed uh, as what they call the hard problem of consciousness and Chalmers is uh, renowned for establishing that uh, that problem in a formal way. There's a lot of ego tied up with uh, our brains uh, status of genius with uh, our capacities um, and these go a long way to preventing us from accomplishing great things for humanity, in my opinion. So really, should it matter uh, what the difference is between a mind and a brain or what we're using it for and um, the pra pragmatic side uh, of these, uh, these questions? I don't think, I don't think um, there's much to gain from delving too much into the brain versus the mind. Um, and it could be just a construction of uh, how we conceptualize things, right? Wouldn't it be ironic if that problem was framed incorrectly and uh, we couldn't answer it because of our uh, our cognitive processes? You know, like what's the irony there? You know, you're, tr you're trying to discover the nature of the brain or the mind and you can't do it because of uh, your biases and your uh, psychological issues. Um, I, I, I would think that was the case, and I would find it, find it quite funny, actually. If we're trying to communicate with one another, we're using words and language and some element of body language as well. And without those words, how do we discuss even concepts like consciousness, mind, architecture, atoms, any of these concepts that actually quite nebulous, really, even though we might think, oh, we know in science what an atom is, it's like actually really not that easy to even uh, define and describe and so on. Uh, yeah, and that's a great point, Jason. I, I really like that idea. Uh, and it, it really drives to the concepts of some core problems that some very famous people have struggled with. Um, you may be aware of um, 
you know, uh, individuals like Alan Turing, uh, mm -hmm. who uh, struggled with uh, the ideas of um, potentially, you know, an individual um, being able to be replicated by a machine and not being able to uh, differentiate whether they're a, a person or a machine and uh, what, what really makes us a human. I really like the idea that every person, um, like I said, is, is unique um, and their words are unique as well. So even though we've got a, a common uh, dictionary and we're using potentially word, one word, even if we boil it down to the simplest case, we've got one word, one definition, that word means completely different things in different contexts for different individuals. And so you could have such a wide variety of uh, variation, yet somehow we can work together and uh, accomplish great things. It's, it's quite miraculous in some sense. And in some sense, you know, it makes me think that like a simulation theory of the universe might be correct because each person is a, a permutation on a given structure, um, uh, the brain, and we each have different words associated with uh, different meanings. And uh, if we go at problems uh, from a group mentality, uh, the diversity of thought is a real strength when it comes to solving problems. Um, the, even though we have slightly different definitions, if we approach it from all these different angles, we're bound to get to the right solution. What's your then take on concepts like God and spirituality and how do you reconcile all that with hard sciences? Are there some sort of particular tricks or tips that you might be able to share with everyone who listens to this to kind of maybe even leverage these two both to kind of play them together? If, from my point of view, I, I was an atheist. I was an atheist up until I was um, in my early 30s. Um, currently 37, so I haven't actually been in the spiritual world for too long, but I really did go through a journey where I had to develop my ego, and uh, science was a part of that ego. Um, in order to move over into the um, spiritual side of things and uh, consider it seriously, because I don't think many uh, scientists who are atheists, and uh, they're atheists because they're scientists, uh, actually um, realize that they don't consider it seriously. And there are certain fundamental ideas in science that prevent us from doing that. Uh, certain things like repeatability. Um, we, in science, uh, you have to validate your result by repeating it over and over and over and over and over again. And, uh, and, and that's fine, you know, if we were creating a, uh, an O-ring for a, a valve, you know, but we're not O-rings and we're not valves. So, uh, Everyone only has one life to live. And there's a certain, like I said, individuality and uniqueness with being who you are. You can't go back and relive your 14th year of life in, in order to um, you know, refine your uh, pickup line to get the girl you wanted when you were a teenager. Uh, you know, so we're going through this once. Statistics don't work for spirituality. If we rely on statistics to get to guide us as individuals, that's flawed. Um, it's, it's great um, to understand how to live in a society, but in order to explore the individual side of yourself, you need to let go of these uh, preconceived notions that science gives you. They, they just don't work on a psychological level. They don't work on a spiritual level. So I don't necessarily think that they are at odds. Um, and, my, and my concept of God really came about when I uh, discovered that uh, I was controlled by, by something that wasn't my conscious mind. I had experiences where, um, you know, I had something interesting happen to me, which I considered interesting at the time, not, uh, not meaningful. They were just anomalies. Uh, but in hindsight, because I'm blessed with a good memory, I could uh, remember several years before where something had happened. And in the light of current context, it was abundantly clear that the meaning of that moment in that time was to get me to this point in the future where uh, they're um, immediately connected uh, and significant. And because I can't repeat that, scientists won't accept it. But it's clear to me on a personal level that that really is the case. So um, recognizing this idea of the 
greater power of the unconscious, the self, uh, the universal mind is really important to me. Uh, it's, it's made a lot of uh, desperate facts and figures and experiences cohesive. So um, my, <laughs> my personality type is uh, ENTP, uh, uh, which predisposes me <laughs> in some respects to uh, seeking out unified theories. Um, so this unification only made sense uh, when I discovered the spiritual side of things. Dude, as you're speaking, I'm having like a series of little minor like can show experiences, uh, like tiny little awakenings within me because what you were just saying is and it really connects very nicely with Jungian psychology that like the conscious mind, that subconscious mind is always processing at like hundred times the capacity of the conscious mind. And we have this ability to observe and notice things that otherwise, otherwise conscious mind perhaps consciously ignores because it thinks it's not important at that point in time. Now your capacity to memorize things perhaps in the subconscious and bring it out of the subconscious to then string together how a series of events brought you to where you are today and how perhaps in, in my case, like, for example, I went through war in Bosnia. You know, a lot of people go like they get stuck on like, there's a Siri comes up. I didn't ask you. Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> how war in Bosnia brings up Siri, God knows, but, um, we might work out in 10 years time. Uh, but a lot of people get stuck on something like war in Bosnia or being through war, not realizing that I, that actually brought me, for example, in my case, to meet my wife in London and then have children and live in UK and do everything that we're doing today, uh, which I probably wouldn't be doing if I was in Bosnia. Uh, probably if I was left in ex-Yugoslavia, I would be Nikola Tesla by now, but who knows? <laughs> you don't know. Ability to connect memory points together into a grander narrative and ability to understand causes and consequences is perhaps one of the big reflections of high intelligence. Uh, and that's what would explain why uh, quote unquote stupid people keep making the same mistake over and over again until they really kind of have that very harsh visceral experience of going like, oh gosh, I shouldn't be doing that anymore. I should try something different <laughs> and innovate right. in my life. <laughs> yeah, there's a quotation, a famous quotation about that. It, and I don't think it's uh, necessarily framed as stupid people, but it's, it's uh, the definition of insanity is to uh, do the same thing over and over again and expect a different result, uh, mm -hmm. you know. So it's even worse than stupidity. I'd rather be stupid than that. Yeah, it's, it's kind of stuckness, right? Yeah. Where you don't yeah, have that idea, where you don't have that little can show happiness. Oh, I could try this. So what, what is your then take on, on nuclear energy and, and these kind of different types of energy? I really see uh, our energy resources as uh, a real driver for any human progress. At some level, um, what you're getting is created from the nuclear energy because all of our energy on earth is uh, primarily coming from the sun. And uh, it's, uh, you know, whether it's, uh, it's usually driven through photosynthesis and, uh, you know, it, it's uh, that receives the energy, the, the plants feed the animals and all of this drives uh, the uh, biosphere, um, which give our traditional forms of energy um, and, uh, and uh, also, you know, the, the wind and solar power are directly related to uh, the sun as well. In terms of nuclear, it's, it's a sort of a special beast in that uh, it's uh, coming from uh, deposits of heavy elements that we're digging out of the ground uh, that uh, naturally decay because they were created in an unstable star at some point as well. So some other sun. Uh, that is to say. And so if you do split the atom, there are different ways to do that. Uh, one is fission and one is fusion. 
Uh, I work with fission power, uh, so effectively taking uranium, putting it in a configuration where it spontaneously uh, uh, breaks uh, or uh, there's a fission, uh, basically a breaking of the atom, which releases uh, these uh, neutrons. And uh, the neutrons themselves are slowed down and redeposit in the fuel uh, and lead to heat. Uh, so basically, it's just a fancy way to get heat. Um, in terms of uh, safety and those aspects, there's definitely a, a stigma around nuclear and justifiably so. Uh, we've had some really significant events in my industry, um, just within recent memory, obviously. Um, but it's one of those things. It's uh, like... Um, you know, we took it out of the box. There's no putting it back. <laughs> you know, uh, it's one one of these things. It's a tool, and tools can be used for good or bad. Um, and so, I, f I feel how we use this technology and any technology for that matter really is a function of uh, how we treat ourselves and uh, the stability. Uh, of our civilization, which is highly dependent, again, on the uh, psychology of the individual human being. So is it true that if you split an atom, you shall find the sun? Uh, find the sun? No. Find energy uh, that is equivalent in nature coming from our sun? Yes. So, um, so if it's a metaphor, it's correct. Yeah. So I think the idea is that, that there's so much energy in an individual atom that when you split it that way, that it can release huge amount of energy. That That's what that's the spirit of that saying is. Yeah, it, it really is. And it's many orders of magnitude larger than any other source, right? And uh, I think that's one of the things people don't realize is that this is such a, an abundant uh, source of energy um, and it's, it's fairly reliable, and uh, the, the waste generated is a, but a fraction of what you're getting from fossil fuels. Um, there are obviously proliferation issues with it. There are waste issues with it. But again, with any technology, even uh, these so-called green energies, there are engineering uh, issues that you have to deal with uh, to uh, create photovoltaic cells for, um, for the sun, you know, to receive the sun, it takes some harsh metals to uh, put those together in order to transfer the uh, photons and, and turn them into electricity. So, um, you know, there are issues with mining. Um, and so, you know, how we go about using these technologies and, uh, and creating these technologies is, uh, is another question. The life cycle of a technology really does have to come into play with respect to any new technology, even uh, digital technologies for that matter. We don't really know what spending 80 years on a uh, little electronic device um, is going to do to us, let alone our children, because uh, all of all these children's now on uh, you know, smaller devices. What does that mean for their social interaction? What does that mean for um, their education? You know, that's a positive, right? Uh, you can now have them educated as much as you want immediately. Um, and restricting that. And, you know, these are all open questions. So really, uh, at the end of the day, we need energy. Uh, I don't see that going away, especially with Elon Musk wanting to go to Mars and beyond. We're going to need all of our uh, energy resources for the uh, foreseeable future. And it, just in terms of scale as well, uh, you made an interesting comment on uh, the on a subconscious receiving 100 times more than the conscious mind. Um, I actually looked it up the other day uh, just because I was interested. So to speak of coincidences, uh, there's 11 million bits received by our uh, subconscious every second, but only 50 bits are received by our conscious brain. So that's six orders of magnitude. Mm. Yeah. Uh, the arrogance of thinking we know how to solve these problems is on the same scale, I believe. If you think your conscious mind really knows what's going on, when your unconscious mind is receiving a million times more information, you're, that's the height of arrogance, in my opinion. And it's almost on the same scale as the, uh, the sun and the earth and the earth being at the 
center of the universe in a geocentric universe. It's, it's quite a coincidence that the ratio of the Earth's volume to the sun is actually one million times as well. So it, I, I like to think about it in those concepts. So shifting your uh, viewpoint from having the Earth to the, be the center of the universe to the sun is almost the same degree of error we're making when we're thinking that we're in control of uh, everything uh, going on in our minds. That actually makes me wonder whether there is some sort of very deeply subconsciously ingrained uh, and engraved reason for why so many ancient cultures have worshipped the sun as a kind of like almost like a very subconscious representation of the capacity of their own subconscious that they can't express in any other way than just go kind of like sun that's the thing right <laughs> oh yeah there, there are and uh, you know i've uh we could talk about this for hours but um i, I think the sun is the prototype uh for uh, even the human anatomy, to be honest, uh, if if you weren't were to not know anything, uh, but you were able to, you were a sensing organism, and you were just put out in the middle of a field somewhere, um, you would immediately look up at this bright object, right? And so if, there's no uh, doubt in my mind that uh, there's certain aspects, including the human eye, uh, are shaped the way they are with circles and uh, central points for focus. Uh, and, you know, even the uh, areola and nipple uh, reflect the same symmetry. Um, and, uh, you know, there, um, there are other reproductive uh, symmetries as well. Uh, these are all um, the way they are because of our environmental influences, structuring our brain in such a way that, you know, something of significance over uh, in location A uh, is comparable to something in location B. So if we, we have that, there's a, an inclination to go in that direction. So I, I think there are some deep connections to these patterns uh, in, in the human mind, body, soul that, they're, um, that are yet to be discovered, to be honest. And so that also brings up, um, I used to, a bunch of years ago, go to... Um, talks from uh, a friend of mine, White Sang, and he wrote a book called Unified Fractal Brain Theory. And he basically makes this giant argument that the entire universe is a binary tree. <laughs> uh, and that like absolutely everything's connected in literally a binary tree uh, fractal. What is your relationship with Jungian psychology? Tell us a little bit about that, and then we'll have one more question to wrap it up after that. What is my relationship to Jungian psychology? So he's my spiritual guru. Uh, from an early age, um, I was different. Um, although I did fit in with peer groups, I knew I was separate from them in, in some respects. So uh, there, were, there was very little... Um, bonding over deeper issues that I found amongst my uh, peers of my own age. And, uh, and so I, from an early age, I uh, relied on reading and uh, discovery of mentors through books. Um, I found it opened up a, a wide world of, uh, of new friends, to be honest. Um, and with Jung, uh, I was at a low point in my life where um, I was suffering through some personal issues and uh, not knowing which way to turn. And like any good engineer, I did some research, <laughs> which is actually quite tough when you're down on your luck and you're not mm. feeling. Yeah. <laughs> and, but, Personally, you know, I find research always tough because <laughs> I'm having to confront the stuff that I don't really know about. It's like, gosh, I just don't know so much. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's quite scary not uh, understanding you know you don't know so much. Uh, but uh, with with Young, it was just a thing that uh, it just came across uh, my laptop while I was looking for, for answers. And uh, as soon as I started to read, it was almost like he was living my life 100 years ago, to be honest. Uh, just the, the parallels, the questions he was asking the personal trials and uh, tribulations that he himself had gone through. And it just so happened, it wasn't just that one uh, reflective experience that uh, made me realize I was like him, 
but he had also reflected on his predecessors like uh, Nietzsche and uh, Goethe and uh, these other great minds that have all gone through these uh, experiences through life. My experience with him is a deeply personal one. Um, he's literally the, the number one guru I have for understanding uh, myself. Um, and so he's my spiritual guide. You know, he had Philemon as his spiritual guide. I actually picture Young as my Philemon uh, in my head. Uh, so, My final question to you for this conversation, it would be wonderful to have another conversation because there's so many questions, is where would you like to see humanity be in 30 years time from now and why? It's the, the question every um, capable person should ask themselves because we are writing the future at the very mo moment we're, we're sitting here. And uh, where do I want humanity to be? This year, I, I won the uh, World Genius Directory Genius of the Year Award, uh, which is the who's, high, who's who of the high IQ world. And uh, I wrote a statement for the world. Um, and I want everyone to realize we're all connected. We're all the same. We're all humans. And these teachings aren't new. Uh, you know, uh, I just, I've discovered some of these things and, you know, I couldn't improve on this idea if I try, if I wanted to. We're all connected. Uh, we're all one, yet we're at the same time fundamentally different from one another. So just like you said, um, if we could learn to listen to one another and go to that place where that other person is uh, and meet them there in order to understand them as a first step. I think that would be enough to accomplish in a 30 year time frame. It sounds simple, but the, the emotional maturity it takes to get to that point where you're able to listen to another person, even in the heat of an argument, Uh, even in the, the heat of a fight, a physical threat, uh, if you could just have the composure and, and uh, compassion, compassion is the right word for that other person, no matter who they are, um, that's the next big hurdle for humanity to get over. And if we could do that within 30 years, I would be ecstatic. I have to ask, a, it's a subset question just before we wrap up, which is, that what does the world and humanity look like when everyone is fully self-actualized? It's a difficult one because there, there are various landscapes that I can envision that would get us to a, a point where we're self-actualized. We've got a lot of people on this planet. Uh, those of us at the top have to reach down. Uh, there's no way to just expect those at the bottom to pull themselves up by, by the bootstraps, uh, just based on uh, external circumstances. Uh, you know, there are a lot of influences uh, to whether someone can achieve uh, quote unquote success or not. Uh, but the first step is helping each other, reaching down, um, giving those people uh, an ear, uh, let them speak to you, let them tell you what they desire. Don't uh, impose a vision of the future on them. They're, they're more than capable of telling you what they want. Um, and then hold hands with them as they work towards those goals. You know, there's a, there's a degree of selflessness there that, that has to transpire. Um, and so, you know, there, there are different steps in this ladder. One of them is food, shelter, electricity, the base level, uh, education, open education for uh, the world. Uh, to res be restricted to no one if they want access to it, to be open to spiritual uh, aspects as well. You know, we're in a world now where it's all driven by technology and science, and there's almost a, a taboo to talk about a belief in a higher power, uh, at least in the Western world. And we can't start conversations uh, having a debate. We need to start by listening to one another. And at that point, Uh, once we all realize our goals, we're all helping each other. Uh, we can get to that point where every individual on the planet can be self-actualized. Fantastic. I, I love this conversation so much. I usually don't ever have any expectations, 
But I think with you, I kind of had expectations inevitably, but this kind of surpassed all my expectations. So I thank you very much uh, for this wonderful conversation. And hopefully we can do another one with further questions that have been popping up in the back of my mind in the subconscious. <laughs> uh, so thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for having me on, Jason. It's always a pleasure to interact with you online. And it's nice to actually get a, a chance to uh, speak with you face to face. Awesome. All the best.